Hi, David Odell here with Odell Complete Concrete. This is our first day on the job site. This is going to be a multi-part series. It's a big job. It's two pours. A lot going on here. We've got the drainage underground. We've got exploratory digging, trying to locate things that have been done a long time ago that you know nobody knows where they are. So there's a lot of different things going on here. We got concrete on this whole side of the house over here by the pump equipment. We're going to fill that area in. We're going to do a cantilever bullnose step wrap around off of that existing. That's going to be a poured in place. And uh, we've got a drain. We've got a drain we're going to tie into. Here's the big rig coming in. Carlos. Well, actually, it's Carlos's son. He's operating the equipment now. So that's Carlos Jr. So this dirt was really nice. Really good soil here. And uh, the grass came out really easily. Especially with the big equipment. That makes everything. And, and we have the space. Space is a big thing when you're using equipment. If you don't have enough space, big equipment can actually be a, more of a problem than they're worth. But in this case, it was perfect. So while we're digging out a lot of dirt, we're already starting the exploratory surgery. That's trying to find where the existing drain pipes are in this area. You know, by digging potholes here and there, try to find a pipe, see if we can tie into it, test it for drainage, see if it's worth tying into. A lot of different things going on. So the big tractor wasn't going to come on this side of the house. It would have had to go over the pool deck and then squeeze through on that uh, precast bullnose cap there, and that would have probably popped right off. So it wasn't going to go through here. So I brought the mini on this side of the house. And then I transferred the dirt to the other side where the other track could just scoop it up and run it on out to the big rig. Now this is going to be a little raised platform of this raised area of the pool deck. And then we'll cantilever step off onto the lower patio as we go out. So here's a drain that we just discovered here. And actually, you know, what that is is it's an overflow for the swimming pool. So if for some reason the float on the pool, you know, that levels, keeps the water fill, full in the pool, or if it rained too hard, or if there's some other issues with the water, instead of overflowing over the top of the pool, it drains out an overflow pipe that goes through the sidewall of the pool into the drain out into the street is the way that's set up. So we had to keep that working. You know, I've had a lot of dump truck operators, and uh, this particular guy, uh, he's not scared, you know what I mean? He's not scared to load his truck up. A lot of guys are kind of scared to top them off, and they want to, you know, not load them all the way. So they got, you know, two trips out of it on an hourly rate, which is going to be costly. But this particular guy, um, he just loads it up, gets it all in one load, and then hits the highway. So there was a drain that was on the opposite side of the house that we were trying to, you know, do that exploratory surgery and locate it. And we we're going to have drains going out both sides of the house because there is holes in the curb at the street. Although we couldn't locate where it went under the existing side yard driveway and the drains that we did find back here in this area, they weren't draining. So we had to reroute the entire drain from that side of the pool to the other side of the pool down the other side of the house. That's the only only sided drains that were working. 
so that's what we ended up discovering and it took us you know we we're doing the exploratory stuff for about a day trying we found a gas line we found the uh, backflow for the pool which we broke trying to find other stuff I had to repair that and I was lucky I didn't break the gas line because it was that you know plastic poly pipe and it, it just uh, we're lucky basically because the inch and a half pool over the pool um, backflow was on top of the gas line so we hit that first then we were just digging around the inch and a half and then we go well here's the gas line no rhyme or reason just out there in the middle of the yard it wasn't even in a direct route towards the pool or anything it made no sense and there was no tracer wire on it so you couldn't even locate where it was even if you wanted to so we got a good four inch drain here and I just uh, reduce it to a three inch right there there's actually th this thing goes about two and a half feet deep right there that riser and there's three lines teeing into it <coughs> Yeah, one of the T's was to a downspout that was abandoned, that was dropping into that riser. Another um, T was going on one side of the pool, and there was another T going um, in a direction towards the other side of the pool. So we utilized one of those branches to go to the other side of the house. There's my nice new six foot Milwaukee red stick. A must have, you know, when you're doing these residential projects where you got minimal slope and you want to rod it and check your level and then double check it as it gets stiff. Those really come in handy. Now nothing square with anything in this particular yard because it's a pie shape. It's on a um, cul-de-sac radius. So the front of the yard's fairly small, but in the back it really opens up. So we're not really um, going, we're not, the only thing we did kind of go straight with was the property line fence. That's parallel, but this form back here is not really parallel with anything. Now because, oh here's that uh, inch and a half pool backflow pipe that I snapped off trying to do some exploratory. You know, try, I was trying to find that three inch drain line that went under the driveway over here, but I never did find it. And when I did find it further out in the backyard, like I say, it was completely collapsed. So I figured, well, if that's collapsed there, maybe collapsed further on out. So we didn't tinker with that idea anymore. We just rerouted everything to the other side other side of the house here's some old wrought iron railing i had no idea where that was at one time but pretty rusty now. But Okay, so right here what we're doing is we're extending the driveway at full width to the property line to allow for RV parking. You notice there's a curb and all that roof tile park, uh, stacked over there. Well, that little return curve is going to come out. We're going to continue the other curb underneath the wood fence. That way we don't get it. Because the property next door is higher, obviously higher. So we're going to retain it with the concrete poured in place curb. And then just you know drop it down to the elevation of the driveway but that's going to be the new return it's about 15 feet past where it used to be then a new gate and that lines up with the back of the house it's straight with the back of the um, house coming across and that's where the new uh, fence will go so you could have an rv basic on the side of your house not see it from the back of your house when you're like entertaining or whatever so you could really have a real disaster on this side of the house, in other words. And it's not going to matter once you get the gate up. No one's going to see it when you're entertaining. Or put the dogs over there, even. Whatever. So 
well. There's that Kura. We knocked that return out. And I was surprised there was no steel whatsoever in that curb. And I'm just going, huh, that's interesting that it's really retaining anything. But it was done monolithic with the uh, other concrete. So that's one advantage. And that's how we're going to do it too, the same way. But we will have some steel in here. We're going to pour the curb with the, with the slab right there. This is within the first pour. The reason I've decided to do it this, so I just pour this little piece over here, and that's my header. That's where the concrete's going to stop. I'm going to pour the other side of the house with this little piece here. What that does, it gives me access for the big pour, getting into the backyard, because that'll be sticks. This will be the second day after the first pour. I can walk across here, you know, and uh, work the concrete fairly easy without having to hop, jump, and skip around. You know what I mean? Over here, these are kind of crucial little planter beds because this is basically the catch basin for the entire water drainage of this entire backyard. So you notice I have a drain in there, and that's a lower than everything else. And then, of course, because this area is so big, we've got the pool deck running off into these planters in the entire slab, the 30-yard slab that we're going to be adding, all draining into these two planter areas. So I've got two drains over here, and you can see the risers along the side of the house there. Two more drains over there. And, uh, you know, hopefully it picks up everything and drains out. And I think it will because we got two, four, five, six drains dropping into a four inch. So it's going to go out as long as the drains don't clog. You know, like usually what happens is leaves gather around the top where it actually drops in. That's where it clogs normally. So those are, you got to keep an eye out on those on a heavy rainfall for sure. If you're at home, of course. I mean, if you're on vacation, then well, you're just out of luck. Over here, we're just, uh, we put this form in. That's This form is really not straight with anything either. It's another pie-shaped pie configuration here. And then we have a little, we have a fence right there, metal one. Then we have a small little three-foot gate. And we got to be below that gate because we don't want to have to raise it. And it's all steel. We'd have to cut it re well. It, it'll be a real nightmare. So we just uh, went to the bottom of it, basically. So the gate's going to still function. So there's a hole, right? See that hole underneath the 2x4? Well, that's another. That's your, your main water supply line that goes over there to that hose bib. And also it supplies some sprinkler valves and stuff. So we left that hole open after we did our exploratory dig. So that way we could see it, you know, while we're driving the stakes. So we wouldn't puncture it. Now, as far as a bender on this, this is just some siding. I found at Home Depot, it seemed like, oh, it looked pretty good. That's what I normally do. I just walk through the lumber aisle and I look for stuff that will serve a purpose, even though it's not designed for this, but it was beautiful. And it's definitely reusable. A little ex on the expensive side, though. I think it was 40 bucks for that one chunk. But it worked great, though. Some kind of plastic composite. Now that's a six inch piece and that's what I needed. I needed actually I needed eight inches, but I got a six and the styrofoam you see there's the styrofoam there. I'm gonna glue that right onto that form. And that styrofoam six also. It's an inch and a half cantilever bull nose there on the top. And it's sticking out you know, about an inch and a half as well. Kind of matches the existing precast is what we were kind of going for. But if you notice the bottom of that foam on the right bottom side, notice how I added another chunk of foam to meet that height requirement there That because we're matching the existing and it was about, you know, over a six inch step. So what I did is I trimmed some foam off of the, the um, there was actually an insert that was in that foam and it's throwaway typically 
so I used that and I squared it up with a cutoff saw and just glued it to the bottom of the foam to make it fit my needs. So now I've got a string line about every 10 or 12 feet all the way across. Straight drainage, straight soap from the right to the, to the left to the planter beds. No real break points or nothing real tricky about it. It's just a straight grade slope, which is kind of nice. There is some valleys and stuff on the other side of the house. But in this area, um, simple. We got five inches of slope all the way across. Not very much, but it's enough. As long as you've got your screed pins set, you know, accurately and you follow them when you're screeding off, then you'll be good. But this is something that you don't really want to freehand. So I got all the curbs set up over here on the left side and it's just going to taper down at the bottom. The big rig already hit the road and now I just did the fine tuning, generated a little bit more, more material which will easily fit in my dump trailer. Hi guys, this is uh, day five. We're back on the job. We just removed, uh, we're mid morning right now. We got all the dirt out of here. We got it nicely graded out, I think. Pulled some string lines across, looking real good. I wanted to show you my new level that I happened to find at a, a garage sale. And I'd never seen one like this or anything made in this particular region. Here it is, made in Israel. I don't recall seeing any levels ever or any tools made in Israel. So I had to get it, it seemed kind of unusual. If anybody's seen any of these out there, let me know about it in the comment section. Uh, We'll talk a little bit more about this thing or if anybody knows where it came from or how many are actually here in the United States. Talk to you later. Yeah, that might have been a good find I got. Occasionally I get lucky and find some decent stuff at garage sales. Well, on the preparation for compaction, it's pretty much undisturbed because we didn't over excavate. I mean, if you over excavate, you know, then you're gonna, you're actually disturbing the natural compaction of it. So when we cut the dirt, we cut it pretty much on the money. That way we don't have to um, do a lot of prep on the groundwork as far as compaction goes. So undisturbed soil, you know, is your best bet. And then we flooded the job about for two days we flooded it before we even uh, started tying the rebar in and then we flooded it one more time before poor day this is the pink bar from Owens Owens Corning they manufacture this stuff basically it doesn't rust that's the beauty of it really and it's 3 8 diameter 
according to the uh, brake test on this stuff, comparable, it's comparable to half inch rebar steel. But what I really like about it is the fact that it doesn't rust and it's lightweight. Like single handedly, I can carry probably 50 of those 50 20 foot lengths. But you know, if that was steel, you're probably looking at maybe five or six. Here we are at the uh, landfill. would have been a lot easier just to throw some you know six six ten gauge wire mesh in there because it would have took about you know 30 minutes to complete this whole thing but this is better it's a little more effort a little more work but in the long run it's going to last a lot longer So I decided to put some expansion foam along the house because this is a pretty big pour here and I don't really want the con and I'm going to be saw cutting it. So my thinking behind this is that I don't want the concrete attached to the foundation at all in any way or in contact with it. So that way when this concrete starts to shrink overnight, because I'll saw cut it the next day. When it shrinks overnight, it can freely move away from the house without having to crack. That's my philosophy on that. That'll buy me some time. In other words, to get the cuts in here before I have to deal with any cracking. Although I will put one wet, wet join in the concrete off the corner anyway, but just a little bonus. Also, we got to do a um, little freestanding patio cover there. Anyway, stay tuned for pour day because that's going to be a real beauty. You'll get to see how I strip and face that cantilever ball nose and how I make it absolutely magnificent. Have a good day. Make sure you like, share, subscribe. Talk to you later.